Let's pray. And Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but it did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? The man replied, Sir, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then we cut it down. Father, the concept of vineyards and planting and fig trees and temples that are shut down by Jesus on the basis of no good fruit is found. And on the individual as preached consistently through the book of James, who says that faith without works is dead, For the vineyard owner, for the apple tree orchard person, if one third of their trees are dead, it's their responsibility to remove them so the living trees can live. What a mystery. May we honor you now. May we recognize that God will not be mocked. That these truths are eternal, written Old New Testament, written in the stars. They're written under the rocks of the foundation of the earth. These hidden gems of truth that you reveal through Christ Jesus, through your prophet Isaiah, and now into the Holy Church through the Bible, we pray once again that we could have ears that hear and eyes that see the truth of you fixing the mystery, how it is that a tree planted with every condition to thrive doesn't. And yet in Christ, mysteriously, by no work of our own, you find the ability to forgive us and to move through us so that fruit can be evident on our life. Once dead, now alive. Connected to the vine, the fruit of the Spirit thrives in Christ's church. May you find into the fellowship today and every time you approach the churches that make up the Holy Church in Lubbock, may you find fruit on your tree. Bless and keep us, Father. We thank you for this mystery. We thank you for grace, for your sovereign work to take dead things and make them alive. And we pray once again that we could stand in awe of your revelation, of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. How are y'all? Well, how are you? What? Great. <laughs> Glad to be back. We are in chapter 5 today. We're going to stick with this one chapter. And it's the, the bookend of the, the first five chapters, again, of Isaiah. is God establishing His case. Um, I mentioned before there's a lot of uh, sym symmetry and repetition in the Bible. Isaiah, I believe when the numbing ends on the the uh, remnants, the Jewish people who have the gift of faith that Romans describes as being numbed, I believe Isaiah is going to be their Romans. The book of Isaiah is going to be the, the book of the zealous Jewish Christians who are excited, chomping at the bit. We know, we know Jesus said, St. Paul says as well, to the Jew first and then to the Greek or to the Gentile, that we're going to be astounded at the power, the perseverance, the strength, the courage, the preaching, the celebration, the praising, the joy that's going to come from our Jewish brothers and sisters who are in Christ as well. When the day comes, the Scripture says when the numbing will end, when the full number of Gentiles comes in, and then uh, the movement will come. So we're studying a book um, that is very potent, and I'm excited to do that with you. The first five chapters 
set out God's case. And if you remember in chapter 1, the basis of his case that he, he continues to write about in the next three chapters, chapter 1 says, here's the deal. This is what I did, said the Father. I found a bunch of people who were children. Now, we love to interpret that to say, I'm a child of God, and he's saying I'm his child. No, he's saying, no, no, in this sense, you're a child in that you were useless, weak, vulnerable. And he said, I found you in that state, and I did two things. I strengthened you, and I exalted you. I took you as a person of weakness, and I gave you strength, and I gave you purpose. I gave you exaltation, a heightened identity. And he said, here's my judgment. That's what I did. What did you do? He said, you used your new position of exaltation and strength to defect from me. That's the judgment. On Sunday, we talked about uh, Psalm 86, the, the concept of punching through a prayer. You pray the gospel, then you pray the mightiness of God. And in the next phase, before you pray about your actual circumstance, you pray about what it's going to look like when you're delivered from this scenario. And the question is, are you going to be drawn deeper into God, or will you defect from God? When God delivers you from this chain, are, is that going to help you with your walk from God? Because the ultimate goal in life is to be dependent on the Father. Thorns in your sight are good as long as they're used to keep you close to the Lord. Freedom is negative if it allows you to defect. See, that's the judgment you see all through the Scriptures. Isaiah chapter 1 says, That's my basic charge, says the Father, over my people. Um, chapters 2, 3, and 4 we covered two weeks ago. Nick did an outstanding job last week. Um, am I right? Yeah, he did. So... I was sitting in our staff meeting last Tuesday just marveling at the amount of talent that God has pulled into this Disciples Church in West Texas. <laughs> and we're all young, except Jim, you know, he's so old. Uh, although Jim, Jim's the one that says when he grows up, he wants to be Dennis Reeves. Um, we have so much giftedness pull. It is, it's almost a, a, it causes you to tremble. Why? We know what, but why? Why would God accumulate so much here? Well, chapter 5 ends this section. Chapter 6 is going to be that vision that he received, the commission. But before we move to chapter 6, we have to dwell on chapter 5. And I'm going to warn you, it's a cliffhanger. It ends on the cliff. And so, let's proclaim the scripture, then we'll interpret it. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared, out, cleared it of stones and planted it with choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out the wine press as well. He looked for a crop of good grapes but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for you for my vineyard than I have already done for it? When I look for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but he saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but he heard cries of distress. Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you, have, and you live alone in the land. The Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, surely the great houses will become desolate, the fine mansions left without occupants. A ten-acre vineyard will produce only a bath of wine, a homer of seed, only an epith of grain. Woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks, who stay up late at night till they are inflamed with wine. They have harps and lyres at their banquets, tambourines and flutes and wine. 
but they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of His hands. Therefore my people will go into exile. For lack of understanding, their men of rank will die hungry. Their masses will be parched with thirst. Therefore the grave enlarges its appetite and opens its mouth without limit. Into it will descend their nobles and masses, with all their brawlers and revelers. So man will be bought, will be brought low, and mankind humbled. The eyes of the arrogant humbled, but the Lord Almighty will be exalted by His justice, and the Holy God will show Himself holy by His righteousness. Then sheep will graze, as in their own pasture. Lambs will feed among the ruins of the rich. Woe to those who draw sin along with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes. To those who say, let God hurry, let Him hasten His work so we may see it. Let it approach, let the plan of the Holy One of Israel come so we may know it. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks, who acquit the guilty for a bribe but deny justice for the innocent. Therefore, as tongues of fire lick up straw and as dry grass sinks down in the flames, so their roots will decay and their flowers blow away like dust, for they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the Lord's anger burns against His people. His hand raises and He strikes them down. The mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuse in the streets. Yet for all this... His anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. He lifts up a banner for the distant nations. He whistles for those at the ends of the earth. Here they come, swiftly and speedily. Not one of them grows tired or stumbles. Not one slumbers or sleeps. Not a belt is loosened at the waist. Not a sandal thong is broken. Their arrows are sharp. All their bows are strung. Their horses' hooves seem like flint. Their chariots' wheels are like a whirlwind. Their roar is like that of a lion, their roar like young lions. They growl as they seize their prey and carry it off with no one to rescue. In that day, they will roar over it like the roaring of the sea. And if one looks at the land, they will see darkness and distress. Even the light will be darkened by the clouds. Have a good day. <laughs> Let's go to our notes. The first thing that we see, Isaiah is doing something different. He is called to sing. At this point, he's been prophesying from a vision. Now he's singing a song. Singing a song about God and a vineyard. It's explicitly written. Um, there's the, the the place of singing in in holiness in Christ's church in God's people is has always been exalted. In fact, if you look at Scripture, the there's only a few things mandated for the church when we're worshiping God, and singing is one of them. We're commanded, called. Of course, in Christ, your duty becomes your pleasure. You want to. But there's something that happens when truth is sung as opposed to spo- be spoken. There's a, something different happens, something deep happens. That's why the Reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, wrote so many hymns because they knew that the gospel preached needed to be a sung gospel as well as spoken and heard. And so imagine this song. Isaiah is singing a song. I don't have the, the, uh, the, the tune to it, so I just have to say it. Um, Maybe one day we'll hear what the tune is. And we're going to move from what to God's sentence to six woes into how God's going to carry out that sentence. So the what. What? Number one, all the conditions for fruitfulness are available. It's an interesting juxtaposition that's going to take place here. So... Everything you could ever want. Uh, a fertile hillside means fertile and anointed. 
blessed and chosen by God. He dug it up. He cleared out the stones. He planted it with what kind of vines? Choices. Choices the best. He built a watchtower in it. He even cut it a wine press as well. This is a fancy, top-of-the-line enterprise here. So he did all these things. He set this sucker up to win completely. Perfect amount of rain, perfect amount of sun. He looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. So your second one is yielded only worthless fruit. Bad in Hebrew means worthless. If we skip over to verse 7, he explicitly names the fruit he was looking for. So this is a parable about reality. And this is going to, going to be a, an, a reoccurring theme throughout the Bible, including the day Jesus went to the temple. He passed a fig tree that bore no fruit, and he cursed the fig tree. Jesus just hates fig trees, apparently, but he, he cursed the fig tree. And, and I've, I've used the sandwich technique before. This is in Mark. It's in the other Gospels too, but Mark writes it in a sandwich fashion where you have the fig tree is cursed. Then Jesus walks to the temple and he closes down the temple that day. He shuts down the... When he shut down the, the, the money changers, again, he wasn't... A lot of people judge that as we shouldn't have the book nook or we shouldn't have the... The, the, the men shouldn't be selling meat for whatever. and No, that's not the point. That it's so shallow. For Jesus to overturn the money changers was him to turn off the lights and the air conditioning and the microphones and the organ. He shut down all the, all the elements of worship that we'd grown used to to use as the machine of worship. People were coming in from out of town and you needed the money changers to change your Roman denarii into temple coinage. You, you weren't allowed to take. That's why when, when Jesus was asked about taxation, and he, he got him on that question, because he said, before I answer your question, can you show me a coin? And his accusers actually brought coins with Caesar's emblem into the temple, which is blasphemous. They were discredited like that. You see, Jesus was real good. And so for Jesus to dismantle the money changing was not Jesus to be mad at money or to be mad at selling things and buying things. It was he went to a tree looking for fruit and he didn't see it. He declared over the temple, you were supposed to be, this is the fruit, a house of prayer for who? Many nations for my God. But you've turned this place into a den of robbers. And as we've argued before, a den is not where you do your robbing, that's where you go after you've robbed. Your den is where you put your feet up. So Jesus said, I came looking for this, I didn't see what I wanted, instead this is what I saw. I wanted prayer, instead I saw justification for your sinful life. And so he shut down the temple. When he walks back on the way, the next morning as you're walking back into Jerusalem, what's happened to the fig tree? Shriveled all the way to its all the way to its roots. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. This is a theme that we're going to see in the scriptures. Jesus said you'll know a tree by its fruit. James says, show me your, show me your faith. Uh, what? You have your good works. You can't show me your faith, but I have faith and I can show you my faith through my good works, is what he's saying. You will always have an expression of God's glory through your life. It will show fruit on your life. There's no such thing as a fruitless faith in Jesus Christ. Everything Jesus came to have, worshipers, an assembled body, He's going to get. He's Jesus. He gets what He wants. He's the Son of God. And so if He wants worshipers, He's going to get worshipers. And if you're in Christ Jesus, and you truly are in Christ Jesus, your heart will worship Him. It's not a matter of if or how you're feeling today. You may not. Ex it may be deep in your spirit that this is happening, and you learn to express it in your outward self. But God's going to get what He wants, Jesus especially. So that's always going to be the question, is when Christ Jesus walks up to you, to your family, to the church you worship in, worship Him in, is He seeing the fruit He intends to see? Well, bam. That's a constant theme through Scripture. 
So we're going to see it in one of the most the earliest places here in Isaiah chapter 5, the part of the song. So the, the two pieces of fruit, it's looking for two explicit things in a nation that's planted with every ounce of blessing, every ounce of anointing, food, care, worship, love, the presence of the living God. This is what he expects to see. Number one, the intended fruit was order and balance. Order and balance. Instead, God saw innocence slaughtered. So what he intended to see, you know, if you've, as a farmer, if you've given everything the right conditions, you ought to be able to go to bed, and or maybe even on vacation, and come back and see fruit. So he let the machine run. And given the essence of all the conditions surrounding it, everything pointed that this thing should be ordered and balanced, he came home, what did he find? Bloodshed. No order. When, it, when a society, and I, I've mentioned this before, this isn't about how to be nice, and we need to go and rectify all social injustices. Social justice ought to be a symptom of a righteous community. You can't, you can't go and, and just tell everyone to be nice to each other and be happy, and it, just, and it just miraculously changes people's hearts. When people tell me I need to have white guilt, I'm not like, I can see my heart. I'm repenting. No, it's, it's frustrating, because we need something more than quick fixes, secular fixes. And so when the Father has planted a people in a holy ground, the natural symptom ought to be justice and mercy for all. And you can tell a just society by how they treat the most vulnerable. There will be no bloodshed in heaven. The intended fruit, second one was, uh, the intended fruit, I messed that word up somehow. The intended fruit was uh, right and was supposed, to, oh gosh, what am I trying to say? <laughs> well, something. The words I have on my notes is right and true. What is right and true? That's what righteousness means. And so in the first one, you notice that God says, I wanted order and balance, but what I saw was this, innocence shed, innocent blood shed. And the next part is I wanted, I was looking for rightness and truth, and instead what I heard was, in, in your blank, distressed cries. I'm calling you. Your phone ring is my alarm clock. That's what's weird. It's like I wake up from a dream. This is all a dream. So God was looking for something and He saw something else. He was listening for something and He heard something else. And verse 4, everyone asks questions about the mystery. Why does God do this? Why does God do that? Well, God's going to ask you a question that's just as mysterious. And He's got a better question. Verse 4. Read it. Who can read it for us? You got what, what could have been done? What more could have been could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? That's a good question. <laughs> we have tons of questions for God. This is God's question to to his earth. What more could you have wanted? The real answer to that question is a mystery now we see it in the New Testament. Regardless of the conditions around you, you and I are conditioned to bear bad fruit by our sin. You can put me, without Christ's forgiveness and His righteousness on me, you could put me in the the most conducive environment for thriving, and I won't. In any eternal sense. There's something fundamentally off. This is proof. And how often do we say, as soon as my conditions are right, then I'll have peace. Or as soon as my conditions are right, then I'll honor the Father. And it's the backwards. It's, it's, it's completely been disproven through experience, through Scripture. We had perfect conditions and this is what it produced, nothing better. That's the sentence, and that's the mystery, or, or the what. What happened? All the conditions were available to you, and what did you do? You yielded worthless fruit. To go to chapter 1, same thing. 
I strengthened you and exalted. I gave you everything you could need to function with righteousness. And what did you do? You used that position of privilege to defect from me. It's the same thing, different image. One's agricultural. One is being raised, an individual being raised up out of poverty into wealth and uses their wealth for wickedness against the one who fed him. So that's what. Here's the sentence. As we see in verse 5, Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. Hold on to your hats. First, I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. Number two, if these aren't your notes. These aren't your notes. I'm just I'm reading from the Bible. Number two, I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds, do not rain here. So here's on your notes. Three things, three primary things happen. Number one, I will remove the conditions that cause fruitfulness. Before you go on, what was the la- the, uh, the true mystery? Verse four. Well, true mystery is question, question in verse four. Verse four. Mm-hmm. Okay. So go home. Every time you question God, before you question God, read verse four. I will remove the conditions that cause fruitfulness. Uh, and this isn't a petulant thing. Because, I mean, there's some nights where I'm holding John Paul. It happened last night. And he's screaming the same volume, whether I'm holding him or I'm in the other room and I'm watching Florida beat LSU on TV. Either way, it's the same amount of screaming. You know, so you're, but God's not doing that. He's not being petulant to say, well, you're not fruitful. But it, and that's, we've, seen, we've seen God disprove bad parenting. Remember, no amount of eating your own cooking produces repentance. Uh, cause, like it doesn't work. There needs to be a, a heart transformation. Um, in the same sense, this is not God being a bad dad saying, I, I want to go watch baseball. I'm going to neglect my child for my sake. Instead, he's leading us through a process that's for his righteousness sake. It's better than, than selfish parenting. Did John Paul quit screaming? No, not until mom goes in there. He's got us well trained. He is consistent. <laughs> He's got one purpose, and that's to be held by mom. He's single-minded. He's really, really good at what he does. He's the third kid. So that's number one. Number two is, I will leave you vulnerable and defenseless. Number three, I will call forth agents of destruction. He moves on from there. So again, that's the what is the mystery of verse four. Here's, as frustrated as you get at life, this is what God's articulated. Here's my frustration, says the Lord. His sentence is, I'm going to do these three things. I'm going to remove what causes fruitfulness. I'm going to leave you vulnerable. And then I'm going to call forth agents of destruction. So I'm not going to leave you vulnerable and think, well, when someone comes along, they're going to mess up your garden. Instead, he whistles for them and brings them there. Then you've got six woes. In parentheses, write condemnations. So he moves from he moves from general polarization of this is what I was looking for, this is what I saw, this is what I was looking for, this or here listening for, this is what I heard, to now, in case y'all are confused, let me get ser- let me get let me talk about the groups and how they're represented in this sinful system. And he talks about six different people, people groups, based on their lifestyle and behavior. The first one, verse 8, Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you live alone in the land. The Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, Surely the great houses will become desolate. The fine mansions left without occupants. A ten-acre vineyard 
A bunch of bad stuff will happen. We've got to move to our notes. We read it. Verse 8 says, Woe to those who take too much. In parentheses, anticipate poverty. That's the judgment. It's the reversal of uh, the, the Beatitudes. It's truly the last will be first. He's, and the first will be last. Um, what are those who take too much when the, war, when the Lord moves upon you? Your experience of this is going to be severe poverty. Verses, 12, uh, verses 11 through 12. Woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks, who stay up late at night till they are inflamed with wine. They party a lot. They have no regard for the deeds of the Lord. They have no respect for the work of His hands. Therefore, my people will go into exile. They will die of hunger, and they will be parched with thirst. Verses 11 through 12 in your notes. Partiers who overindulge. Now, you always have to pause on these things because someone's going to say, as, as Peter said, it's easier, Jesus said, it's easier for a rich man to enter the uh, a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich man. And, and Peter said, well, that's relative. I mean, I'm rich compared, I mean, we left everything for you. And we left our wives and our families, our businesses to come follow you. And Jesus said, don't worry, you'll be handled. And then he says, these things I'm talking about are impossible with man, but with God they're not impossible. And so this is not... These things can easily be pulled out of Scripture and to be preached to guilt those who have wealth relative to others. This can be preached to guilt people who have wine at night. Right? They can, be, they can easily be... And you're missing the point if that's what you're doing. This isn't about... We know in the end God's, Jesus turned water to wine. He's not against wine. There's something deeper. It's too easy to pick one of these woe groups and to hate that group. That's a real temptation in the church to, to identify someone other than you and to point the finger and say, you see, whoa, whoa, whoa. But that's not the point. He's saying in this city who is clearly at odds with God, against God, he's got an issue. But the, the partiers who, who are so relaxed they feel like they're celebrating. He's saying, you're celebrating in a society where there should be no celebration. You're celebrating. There's no, I'm not joining you, says the Lord, in your celebration. I'm not, I'm not with you on this at all. And so again, just in case you're with us and you're... Don't take any of these groups as fodder to judge. Verses 18 through 19. Oh, hunger and thirst. Instead, Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. There's some interesting things here. Verse 18 and 19. Woe to those who draw sin along with cords of deceit and with wickedness as with cart ropes. So they're, pull, they're pulling. This is their life song. They're, they're, making, they're making progress in life. By pulling ropes. And what kind of ropes are they pulling? Sin, deceit, wickedness. Uh, I've, I've written sin, emptiness, and wickedness. That's literal from Hebrew. So it's people who pull, who pull lives by ropes of sin, of wickedness, emptiness, sin, to taunt God. What they say here is not... They're taunting God. Let's see. Let God hurry. Let Him hasten His work so we may see it. Uh, let it approach. Let the plan of the Holy One Israel come so we may know it. In this long, that's not, a, that's not an authentic plea. That is a taunt as they live their lives of pulling ropes that are absolutely opposed to God while recognizing there is a God and they're mocking Him as they do it. There are always mockers you see in the New Testament and the Old Verse 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good. And, and this is a great passage, right? Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That translates most clearly as who command and teach contrary to the truth. It's 
It's naming a lot of things about a society that is not blessed by God, not one with God, and that's alive and well in our society today. The eagerness to reverse truth, first call it relative, and then be absolute themselves. I've, I've mentioned D.A. Carson wrote a book called The Intolerance of Tolerance. There's these slippery slopes you see in societies. Tol tolerance used to mean, how many people do we have in here? 400? <laughs> Close. But we would agree that there are different understandings in the room. Let's just be aware that pe not everyone agrees with you. That's what tolerance means, social tolerance. The new form of tolerance says you have to identify the most progressive thought and you have to agree to that or you're a jerk. The intolerance of tolerance. So it, it's a slippery slope that starts off by saying you've got truth. Tolerance pulls you in to say, well, relativism. So there is no absolute truth. And then there's a new absolute, which is the most progressive. And if you don't agree with this, you're a bigot. It's the, the evolution of the intolerance of tolerance. So the movement, it's over time, but that's the evolution we're seeing right now. That if you don't agree with something on the far left, you by definition are a racist or a misogynist or something. And that's real dangerous because it's a, those things can be, they become so absolute that they actually, when you back off and you take away time and see where we've come from, you really can be a society that calls evil good and good evil. You, call, you absolutize it. This is the way it is. So when you shift from firm foundation to shifting sands, the scariest part is to go to a firm foundation again because the likelihood of that being truth isn't great. It's normally socially conditioned. Verse 21, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. This translates to mean those who look at themselves for wisdom and understanding. In parentheses next to wisdom put reveals truth. Biblical wisdom means it's something that has to be handed to you. God intervenes in your life, gives you a word, if you will, a, a dream, a, a scriptural mandate that's different than what you... It didn't come from you. You didn't discover it or, man, or manufacture it. It was revealed to you. It's the basis of orthodoxy. It's, it was shown to you from God. Stranger than fiction, not from you. It's from God. So wisdom means revealed truth. Understanding means strategy for living. The most extreme would be street smarts. Um, so, woe to people who in their search for wisdom and understanding, for revealed truth and strategy for living, they look in the mirror. Uh, in the literal Hebrew it says two words to themselves, um, who are wise in their own eyes and in their own sight, meaning they, they look at their own face. So they, they marvel at themselves, like, wow, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good to meet me, you know. Uh, and just o overly confident in themselves in terms of wisdom and, and understanding. That at all that does not describe our country at all, by the way. Uh, we don't like mirrors in our country. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Uh, I heard something recently. It said, wouldn't it be interesting if mirrors didn't show your your attraction? It showed your character. And uh, the gospel would say, and then you would repent immediately when you realize you have nothing of worth in your own character apart from Christ. It's all manipulative. It's all off. Uh, your best love is conditional. Uh, it's selfish. It's We need help. So, verses 22 through 23 has the final woe. It says, woe to those who are, I love this, heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks. I want to hear another version of that. Do we have another? This is NIV. Pretty similar? Yeah. Valiant. So, <laughs> sounds like college, doesn't it? A hero at drinking wine, a champion at mixing drinks. 
who acquit the guilty for a bribe but deny justice to the innocent. Uh, literally in, in the Hebrew, um, what this says is, woe to those who live in a drunken strength that justifies the wicked. I'm going to pause right there. Uh, Coffin, who's the, he was, I think he was at Princeton, Yale, somewhere. When I hear the, uh, the Ivy League schools, they're so elevated, I think of them on the moon, so I don't, I don't know where they are <laughs> uh, geographically. They're somewhere, I've heard. But he was the, he was the chaplain, and he wrote a really interesting book. Uh, some of it was a little extreme for me, but he mentioned something neat interesting about violence. And violence you could use, violence is talked about in the Old Testament as an example of an overt sin against God. But the real sins of violence wasn't necessarily the act of violence, but it was the other two parts. It was the desire to be violent and the justification of violence. Mm -hmm. uh, you can apply that to any sin. The desire and then the justification of it. So, it was, if you, if, if, Somebody attacks a loved one of mine or attacks one of you, and uh, I do nothing, I'm sinning by omission, right? If I do something to the point of even injuring or killing the person, I sin through violence. And what that would say is sometimes in a fallen world and in our state, we are stuck between a rock and a hard place so that when we engage in something difficult, the worst thing to do is justify it. The best thing to do is seek God's forgiveness. I was stuck in a world of sin, rocking a hard place. Father, help me. And we rarely take those arguments. We normally over justify or we over hate. And so what we see here is woe to those who live in a drunken state that justifies wickedness. So that when someone is seeing their heart repenting, the leaders of the community say, Oh, you were good. We understand you were justified in that. You're good. No repentance. If, if you're justified in your wickedness, that's a symptom of never repenting, never seeing your heart. You, your life is just fine. I was justified. And at the same time, in, literally in Hebrew, it says, and takes away the righteousness from the righteous. You could call this the greatest sin, that twofold here. One is that those who do wicked are celebrated and justified, and it continues. Those who are living by the righteousness that comes by faith alone, their lives are taken, their honor is, is raped, they're, they're, they are not treated as they should. And in a just society, those who live by the righteousness that comes by faith should be the most exalted. Those who are wicked should be the most humbled. But in this society, and in this society, it's what we see here, that the wicked are justified, and those who live by righteousness, even their righteousness is mocked and attempted to be taken from them. It's anti-God. It's anti the kingdom of God, which is why Jesus was sent. And to those last four, he has one declaration that they need to anticipate decay and destruction. Luke 13 is where I read that parable in our prayer. The Father's judgment is that in this case, this is not salvageable. Now, the good news is there's only one prerequisite for resurrection. You have to die first. And so we know how God acts, that even death is not the last word. Even when God says there's nothing of worth here. That which was righteous has been taken. There's nothing here. There's nothing to build on. I'm going to cut it down. Where you get the root of Jesse. If you read the root of Jesse correctly, it's bad news than good news. The bad news is God's going to mow down the nation to a stump. And then from that stump, there's going to be a root of life. It's both. We love the second half. We hate the first half because it scares us. But 
This is the essence of the gospel. When God looks at us, He doesn't see anything of salvage. You're not redeemed because you're redeemable. You're redeemed because He's glorified when He redeems something that looks and appears in every ounce irredeemable. You're not loved because you're easy to love. You're loved because God is that loving. That's the height of, and the depth and the width of every doctrine, including the doctrine of human depravity. That we don't have it. We, we aren't attractive to God. And yet somehow, he says, when you're buried and resurrected, somehow my perfect creation, which y'all tarnished, says the Lord, will be even better through redemption. And so that's how we're going to end this chapter with this done concept. But we know the gospel. Isaiah 53 will preach the gospel as well. That someone's going to take the, the beating that we deserve so that we can have re- resurrected life, renewed, redeemed life. So, again, we went from what to the sentence to the woes, so specific condemnation. So he went, he went like St. Paul and like a lawyer, went person by person and said, even those who had righteousness don't have it anymore. This is a town that's completely depraved. This is, as we read before, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, how is he going to carry out the sentence? This is how he ends by saying, (coughs) verse 24, Therefore, as tongues of fire lick up straw, as dry grass sinks down in the flames, so their roots will decay. And their flowers will blow away like dust, for they have rejected the law of the Lord and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. He goes on about his anger, how he won't quit. You notice he's going to start and he's going to keep going. He's going to keep going. Even his hand is upraised and his anger is not turned. And then in verse 26, here's how. He lifts up a banner for the distant nations. He whistles for those at the ends of the earth. So do your notes. How is God going to act on His sentence over Israel and Judah? First, God will make them vulnerable. He's withdrawing His protection. He's not forsaking them. If He was forsaking them, He wouldn't watch. He wouldn't stay with them. He's not forsaking them. He's giving them over to what they deserve. Then... Lift up a standard, a banner, if you will, but a. In modern terms, if he's the guy that scouts out and puts the point of the bombing, here, laser guided, right here, so he puts a standard that's going to attract armies. He puts that on the ground, and I thought this word was wild. It's it's only used twelve times in the Hebrew Bible. Then he, and there's three different ways to say it, hisses. Whistles. Finally, calls in scorn. Those are the three definitions of that word. What does your scripture say? Yeah, but whistle. Got any hisses? It's all whistles. But it's, it's, not a, it's not a trumpet blast. It's almost like a, it's a negative. So that even when he's summoning the nations, he's not loving those nations. As we'll see later, he's going to punish the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, for what they did that he caused them to do. It's a cop's whistle. It's a cop's whistle. <laughs> so he's, he's summoning people that are not his covenantal people. He whistles, he hisses, he calls in scorn to agents of destruction to behold and behold them come. That's what happens next. After he whistles, it says in detail how swift they come. They don't grow tired. They are running. They're roaring. The final blank is their instincts will be to take you and carry you away like prey.
Now, next week we're going to look at Isaiah 6. And he's just preached his entire message up front. And when you look at Isaiah 6, it's, it's mentioned, the Father said, I'm going to put a message on you that's specific, and no one will listen. So you all just heard the message. No one will listen. And it's the opposite of what took place in Nineveh with Jonah. God sent a messenger to, to Nineveh. That message overturned the city by making them into repentant people who called out to the Lord. In this case, God's purpose was not to cause them to repent. God's purpose was to mow them down. But He mowed them down for a greater purpose, as we'll see. And so before, again, as we get up in arms about the justice of the Lord, how could God do that? How could God do that? Number one, remember that by definition, whatever God does is good. If you've got a problem with it, you're in the wrong. He's the source of good. Our understanding of good is so culturalized, and we are marred. If you, if you have a collision with God, I'm just going to warn you. You might know this, but I'm going to tell you up front. He's right. You're wrong. Um, and so the, that concept of God, His free will to do these things for a greater purpose is by definition ultimately a good thing. So, we'll join us back uh, next Wednesday at, at uh, noon. We're going to read chapter 6. It's probably one of the most powerful chapters of the whole Bible. Read it in advance before you come and enjoy it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that, that we, our, our place before you is 100% driven by your grace. We thank you for not only all that you've done, but even choosing to patiently, consistently reveal that without Christ, we are well, not only are we irredeemable, we're unredeemed. Dead in sin. Doomed for destruction. But for those who have faith in Christ, miraculously and for your glory alone, we now know that you will not leave those whom you've redeemed in the dust. You will resurrect the dead. You will have for yourself a people who live for your glory. We trust you, Lord, in all things. We thank you for the grand story, for the big purposes, for the execution, the perfect, the perfect work of your Son, Jesus Christ, and then specifically for how your Holy Spirit has applied that work to the individual believer, many of whom are in this room. We thank you for tearing the veil of our hearts and letting the Holy Spirit come in and preach and proclaim the gospel to us, an unbelievable gospel that is believed by faith, unlocked by Spirit. So bless us as we walk for your glory. Keep us humble and patient, kind and merciful. And may we recognize that we live in the season, not of war, but the season of grace. To preach the gospel so that people would be marked with the blood of Christ. May we have an urgency upon us, a burn within our gut, to go and proclaim the good news. We pray that it would include the recovery of sight to the blind, the forgiveness of sins, the removal of chains. That as we're convicted about sin in ourselves and of the world, we would also know that conviction is always accompanied with a promise that you will deliver it. You will break it. And so we pray by faith and with hope through the gospel, from the book of Isaiah, through John, through Romans, all the way through Revelation till today, that Jesus Christ, the bedrock of the church, would return swiftly. And until that day that His Holy Spirit would prepare for Him and mark foreheads and mark hearts. We pray this all, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.